Okay. 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 And you know, I, I typically have that question asked in in uh, in class that that they're a little confused, and I'll, I'll do my best to try to clarify that. But again, we can talk more about it next. Can I add other variables? You can when it's your turn. <laughs> This is why I was asking her what she had. So that's her answer. Okay. If you want to, when is your turn? Add on to that. You're welcome to. But are you ready to prepare to answer now? Do you want it to be your turn? Okay. All right. Do you had a comment? Go ahead. Well, well, keep, keep in mind, there aren't really any global variables. There are variables that are declared within a class. All right? And I think that's what you mean by global variables. Those are typically called instance variables. They're called instance variables because they have different values depending on the instance. For example, pizza all right, has a size associated with it. That's an attribute. That's a characteristic of a pizza is how big it is, right? You look at that and say, that's a medium pizza, that's a large pizza, that's a characteristic. Another attribute is, yes, it has pepperoni, no, it does not have pepperoni, all right? Um, those are attributes, those are characteristics, and they're instance variables because each pizza will have its own value for it, all right? In other words, I'm not only making large pizzas today. I'll make a large pizza, I'll make a medium pizza. For each one, I can say that's a characteristic of it, all right? That's an attribute. And that is declared within a class, and it's declared outside of the method definitions. Variables that I use as sort of an intermediary step in a calculation are not attributes. They're not characteristics. They're just, think of those as like being a scratch pad. You know, if someone asks me a problem like, um, you know, how much, uh, you know, um, how long is it going to take you to drive from here to there to there? You know, I'm liable to say, okay, you know, let's see. From Elyria to Oberlin is going to be 20 minutes, and then Oberlin to Worcester is going to be, uh, tally it up. And I'm liable to have variables, and I'm liable to like write down notes in my thing, and then add it up and say it's going to be 120 minutes or whatever. All right, so variables declared within a function like that are not attributes, because they're not really a characteristic. They're just part of the process of, of doing some operation. So that's really the difference between the two. When I talk about attributes, I'm talking about these things that are declared outside, whoops, this thing in the case of an order, and this thing in the case of a pizza. Yes. Oh. In case of a pizza, there's two attributes. They're just declared outside of any method declaration. The size and whether there's pepperoni. The order has one attribute, an array list of pizzas. Okay, we're doing the clear fuzzy game. Um, I, think, I think some professors call it the one minute paper. I don't know, there's different terms for it. Where you identify something that's clear about the class and something that's fuzzy or confusing about the class. Who wants to go next? Yes? Um, I'm pretty comfortable with doing the four loops. Okay, four loops. All right, excellent. I don't think I totally understand encapsulation. In, okay, and the notion of encapsulation, okay. All right, who's next? Yes? I think I'm pretty down with the format of how to set up a, a class, a method, a statement. Like a, like a statement falls in a method and a method falls into a class. Okay. Okay, go ahead. And then fuzzy? Uh, I mean, pretty much just like the, the syntax of it, like a completed method, if I'm putting brackets in properly, if I'm putting in parentheses in properly, or, put, or something in the right area. I'll just call that brackets, parentheses, and so on. Next. 
We have three, three down, four to go. Someone once said you can tell how experienced a teacher is based on how long they're willing to wait for an answer. <laughs> All right, inexperienced teachers will ask a question. If they don't get an answer within 10 seconds, they'll feel nervous and they'll answer their own question, you know, 10, 15 seconds in. I've been teaching for full time for 12 years, so I don't know how long that maps to me, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be longer than this. So, who's next? Okay, moment. everything. Yeah. Wow. I mean, at this moment, I'm sure it's the past is not. Well, you know what? I Blame Nora. So, why don't you come here and, and finish the lecture <laughs> right. and, and, and so, you know, give me a little bit of, okay. I mean, yeah. I've taken the DNC sharp. Yeah. Okay. Been he, all this. I really already, but that's why. I'm okay. He hammered this in this. Yeah. Okay. I'd, all right. I'll go there. Um, go ahead. It's not something we went over, but I don't understand what it does. Okay. Uh, when you're declaring the main, the arguments in array that goes in, we don't use it. I'd like to know why. Okay, main arguments. And for you, <laughs> everything else. <laughs> everything <laughs> else but the main arguments. All right. Never did cover that. So, okay, let's see. We have two more. Pretty much fine with the coding aspect uh -huh. and everything, but it's more of the terminology and I guess theory. A lot of the stuff we went over last time, instances, classes, functions, mm -hmm. like the terminology is a little bit different in Java and some of the other stuff I've done so far, so it's still... Okay. All right. Go ahead. You oh, I just think sometimes I get mixed up with C and I try to make it do things that C Sharp can do then. So I guess... Okay. So the thing that you're the thing that you're weak in is remembering the difference between the two. Because I'm still used to using that. I am not <laughs> Professor <laughs> Norod. <laughs> and this <laughs> is not C sharp. Well good. I would be bad if we did if we had like nothing in no entry in that column for you. So at least that completes the loop. All right. <laughs> And confusion between languages really is. That's why sometimes, like, you know, it, it may even seem something dumb, but, like, um, if I have to generate a random number. You know, I've written random number, I've used random number generators in, like, probably in my lifetime, a dozen different languages. You know, like, I don't remember how to do it in a specific one. So even if it's something simple, you know, sometimes I have to look it up. And the nice thing, the one comment I will make is, C sharp and Java, and, and maybe this is a bad thing. I'm, I'm presenting it as though it's a nice thing, but maybe it's not so nice a thing. Is C sharp and Java are very similar in the structure of the code. The shape of an if statement looks the same. Now, that could be a good thing because, like in the old days when we had Visual Basic as like the intro course in advanced course, the syntax was totally different. Yes. But in a way, that might be good because you know you're not in VB land when you're writing Java code. Anyhow, you had more to say? C-sharp is still Java. C-sharp essentially is, is their implementation of Java, yes. Both, and then Java came from C, that's why they're claiming they didn't steal Java, that they're another C derivative and so on, yes. Is Java and C a unique case of how close, like similar no, there's, they are? No, there's actually, there's actually a, uh, a programming uh, convention called ECMA, programming style. They believe. seem exactly the same. I was wondering, are a lot of other languages yeah. relate like that? Yeah, yes they are. So, like if we look ECMA programming it's a standard and again um, John J script Action script. Actually, actually, this is ECMA script, but a lot of these um, um, PHP would follow this. Java would follow this. They all they all are are related in their their origin. So XML. Um, no, XML is a different piece. It mentions it up there. That's what I mentioned. Right. It mentions it, but in a totally different context. So anyhow, yes, there's a lot of languages that resemble 
that resemble this. And that's one good thing in a way. You, you know what an if statement looks like. All right. Clear? Fuzzy? Uh, I still find for loops a little bit. Okay. Excellent. I mean, not excellent, but because this is how my dialogue line is going to work. All right. Pardon me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Is there something in particular that, that you're, you're pretty well happy that you, you think you understand and have down? Um, classes. I think I'm good at those. Okay, classes. Okay. I was going to ask you, but you already volunteered. Is there anything you so volunteered without knowing? Is there anything on this list that you have trouble with? That someone else. So like someone mentioned that they're familiar with for loops. The other person mentioned that they're not sure about for loops. One, someone said that they um, um, declaring variables. Is there anyone that's confused about declaring variables? All right, let's run down. Anyone confused about declaring variables? We already said something confused about for loops. Now here's the diabolical part. Who said that they were clear on for loops? You get to explain to us how for loops work then. <laughs> how do for loops work? Tell me what to write. For. Okay. They begin with for. <laughs> All right. Then you have a parenthesis. Okay. And since we don't have other code, mm -hmm. I would declare int i for our counter and then semicolon. Uh, oh, anti equals zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then semicolon. Mm -hmm. And let's let's say we're going to loop through an array. So we'll say array dot length. I is less than array dot length. And then I plus plus, like semicolon then I plus plus, and another parenthesis, then you've got your curly bracket, and then down low you want to make sure you have the closing curly bracket, Okay. and you have your code in there, and you loop through that array, okay. and do whatever. Excellent. So maybe we just want to print out the array, in which case we'd say something like system dot, in fact let's go and do this. No sense me just pretending to write code. Let's actually write some code. <laughs> it's good to pretend. So I'm going to make a little job called and save it here. And we'll call it loop. So I'm going to get rid of this, all this code. All right, so it's in here. Now I'm going to say string uh, array equals oops, Mike. You see your handwriting at your code, at your typed in code. I'll tell you. Students today want everything. <laughs> 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 My challenge him. All right, let's say that's our array. Oops. All right, so as it indicates that that's an array. And then the statement was made, we could do something like this. And correct me if I make a mistake. For and and i equals zero. I less than a dot length I plus plus curly bracket and again just like with HTML when I make a start tag I always put the end tag there it's best if you put when you put the first brace you put the last brace there like instantly even if there's other lines of code you have to put in between it's also good to indent so I can see at a glance that this belongs to <laughs> this this belongs to this 
this belongs to this, and this belongs to that. Yeah? Is there any reason you use notepad and not notepad plus plus? To make it harder on myself. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like it'll add the brackets in for you and it has a spell check. It's the best feature. It's a spell check. Well, you know, this is a case where I will gr I'll give a deep sigh and grudgingly say if you want to use notepad plus plus, you can. Um, the actual reason that I use Notepad is I can guarantee it's going to be on a Windows machine. Notepad++ would have to be installed. Would that be considered along with your crutch lecture from yesterday? Um, because it formats for your code? That, that's, more like, that's more like holding on a handrail going up the steps than a crutch. <laughs> you got yeah. like a 20 minute lecture I yesterday. Your memory may be wrong, but I guess I was thinking that the dot length was a property maybe and not a method. Well, Size, size is a method. Let's, let's look it up. Java array. No. <laughs> let's look it up. So I could be wrong. All right, here's a list of methods associated with it, the Java class array, and Method summary. Binary search. Binary search. Isn't that one of our projects? Copy of, copy range, equals, deep to string, fill. I actually do not see that. So let's go in and let's click on. Processing an array. You're right. Absolutely right. I stand corrected. I think I was confusing array lists with arrays. I think I was using a size method on an array list um, as opposed to that. So I was getting those two confused. So you're right. That is a property. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to output each trip through the loop system dot out dot print ln, I'm going to output a sub i. All right. Let's try compiling and running that. Java C, loop.java. Java, loop. And it shows the three names. So let's again analyze this. This is the initialization. You do a loop, a for loop is a loop that's meant to be done a predefined number of times. All right. In this case, four are often used with arrays, an array being a list of values. All right. And typically, we want to do some 
thing to each member of the array. In the case of the order, it's an array list, but the idea is basically the same. We want to do one, we want to do something for each pizza on the list. Array elements get subscripted or indexed up with zero. So the first element of the array is element zero. The second element is element one, two, three, four, and so on. So an array with five elements, the subscript goes from zero through four. Zero, one, two, three, four. Okay. So we want to start I out at zero. That's what this is. The initial case, this is what we do the first time the loop gets executed. This tells us, do we want to continue the loop? We will continue the loop as long as this condition is true. I is less than A length. All right. What A length? A length is the number of elements in the array. One, two, three. So as long as I is less than three, this loop will continue. I plus plus simply means that each trip through the loop, when we're done with one trip through the loop, we increment I by one. We add one to I. So coming into this, I is going to have a value of zero the first time through the loop. So I'm going to ask for, give me the name that's in position zero. That's the first name, Mike. I add one to it. I ask for the name in position one, which is Joe. Increment. So I has a value of two now. Give me the name that's in position two. Zero, one, two. That's Jim. The last time through, I'm going to add one to I. I is now three. Three is not less than the length of that array. Right? The length of the array is three, and I has a value of three. So is three less than three? No, it isn't. So we know after that third trip through the loop, we exit the loop. And that's how it goes. So essentially, I could simplify this even further, and I could just put I here. This is a way of counting. To count to 100. All right? By saying, I want to start I off at zero. This as long as I is less than 100, and each time through the loop I want to increment by 1. So this will count from actually 0 to 99. Let's save it. And compile it. And there we go. 0 through 99. Again, we frequently use this in processing arrays because we want to look at every element of the array and do something with it. The example we had from last time is in the order class where we have to calculate the price of the pizza. All right. We do the same thing. We increment i at zero. Our ending condition is a little different here and we use the size function because again that's an array list and not an array. So it's a little bit different. And in each trip through the loop, we increment it by one. So we do this for pizza sub-zero, pizza one, two, three, four. However many pizzas are in that array list, it's going to go and, 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 and grab that pizza. We're then going to go and grab that pizza and get its cost and add it to the total. Yes? While we're talking about loops, does continue and break work the same as they do in C Sharp in Java? I don't know and I don't like them. All right. Let me tell you why I don't like them. From a pure standpoint, that's not good code. All right. A module or a statement should have one entry point and one exit point. If you throw in those continues and breaks, you actually have several exit points to an instruction. And that's not good. So. You'll never see me using them. All right. Thank you. Now, getting back to our for loop example, we could, and the other thing to remember again, OK, 
key point to remember? All right. <laughs> now, what if I wanted to count even numbers from 1 to 100? So I wanted to do 2, 4, 6, 8, pardon me? Well, I wanted the even numbers that are between 1 to 100, right? That's a valid statement. It won't be 1, right? But what if I wanted to go from, show the even numbers from 1 to 100? What would I, how would the for loop look then? Start at 2. Pardon me? Oh, then add 2, do i plus 2. i equals i plus 2. And change 100 to 101. 100 to 101. Okay. So again, how is this different? Well, we're going to initialize i2. So instead of being 0 the first time through the loop, it's going to be 2 the first time through the loop. Our terminal condition is when i is less than 101. So if i is 100, it's still going to continue, but the last time through. And then finally, each iteration through the loop, we're going to say i equals i plus 2. All right, so let's go and compile this. And we see 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on. What if I did this? Compiler. What if I did this? What's I going to be at the very end? It's going to be 102, right? Because the last trip through the loop, when we, after we put out 100, we're going to increment that by 2. We're going to get 102. We're going to look and say, do we continue? No, we don't because I is no longer less than 101, and therefore we're going to drop out. So I is going to have a value of 102. The end, 102. All right. So I hope that clarifies some of the questions on the for loop. Next. Defining classes, methods, and so on. Does anyone have questions about that? Does anyone have questions about everything? Or everything but? What about classes? To something else that you, I'm still a little confused about the private, public. Okay, private and public. We'll add that here. Okay, so let's go through and cover this stuff. This on the other side of that. I have hair and a beard, so <laughs> we got that one out of the way. We talked about the four. Let's talk about main arguments. All right? Main arguments are a way for us to pass something in via the command line. All right? So let's look at our little loop example. We'll get rid of the array. Interesting thing is, is great thing about programming is notice that, well, there's a mix of languages. But in those I've done Java searches recently, so I'm thinking that's probably why Java. Heard about that story about uh, where they were spying on some guy's search history and you can take a test for programming language and then offer him a job and some guys did. Oh really? Yeah, they did so many searches on programming language. Oh. Gave him a test, he passed the test, and then they offered him a job. They were spying on him? 
Yeah, they were going through his search history or whatever. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> how big is search history, though? Like, yeah, it's, it's, I, it's crazy, I feel like you could call the police. <laughs> I feel honored, but also... If he used his Chrome yeah. and he signed into his Google account on the browser, like my phone's history is on my computer. That accept button you click, read the terms of service, you'll be disturbed. <laughs> okay. These arguments to the main. Well, where do they come from? Because you never call the main, right? Well, you do. When you run it from the command line and say Java loop, you're calling the main method in the loop. And I can add parameters to that on a command line. So I'm going to add a parameter here that's going to tell me how many times to do this loop. We're going to compile. Okay. So now I'm going to say job 100. We have input. Does it from 0 to 99. Can you go through? Right. In other words, everything that I've typed in after the Java class, Java loop says call the main method of the loop class. Everything after here is a string array of arguments that can be used in my code to do what I need to do. So in other words, if I say job 100, 200, 300, okay, one would be in arg sub zero, 200 would be in arg sub one, 300 would be in arg sub two. So everything that I put on the command line, I believe separated by commas, that gets, yeah, we're going to find out, certainly. But that is going to be an argument to that main method. And I lied. It isn't going to like that. I probably need to put quotes around them. The space. All right. Um, I, I guess you just put a space between the two, which is weird, but let's try it. And it goes from 0 to 100. If I go and say, do argument 2, up to 300. So you can pass in from the command line. So of limited value, but it's available to you. So if you're doing a lot of command line programming, you could pass in in the command line. You could pass parameters into a Java program that way. All right. So that is Could this that technically line. be empty then if you don't ever plan on passing in arguments? Right, and it's been empty every single time 
that we've run, a code, run our code here, right? Because we've never before today passed parameters to our Java uh, routines. We just compile them and write. Do you write. have to call a string array to make it work still for the main method? The main method is expecting a string array, yes. Every time? Every time, Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. I am going to talk about encapsulation, terminology and theory, and process. I'm going to talk about these all at the same time, I think. All right. You guys will be the judge if I did that or not. All right. <laughs> Let's start out with the word encapsulated. All right. You think of something in a capsule. All right. You get the idea that it's self-contained. Everything you need is in there. All right. So like, um, you know, let's say you have a, 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 an allergy pill. All right. An allergy pill sometimes are in those little like uh, um, capsules where there's those little tiny pills and there's like a million of them, right? Now, it would be a pain if you were to have to take every little one of those million tiny pills individually and take a drink of water and drink it down. So what they do, they encapsulate them. They put them in a capsule, an actual physical capsule. So everything that you need is in that capsule for your allergy pill. So you don't have to take a million individual pills that are tiny. You take the one capsule and you're good to go. Okay. So when you hear the word encapsulated, we mean making it self-contained, putting everything that's relevant to whatever it is we're talking about in one place. All right. So that's the notion of encapsulation. All right. That everything that's relevant for our problem about a particular entity is going to be in one place. Uh, so, how does that come into play here? Well, we have a pizza class. All right, let's bring up the pizza class. And let's talk a little bit about terminology here. What is a class? Can someone define a class? A collection of methods related to an object. A, a class is a template that represents all the members of some entity. Pardon me? An abstraction, yeah. What are we, what are we doing when we're writing, when we're writing software? We're, we're writing models, right? We're making models of real world things. And so, in our case, our model for pizza is the pizza class. So the notion of encapsulation is that everything about a pizza is going to be contained in this pizza class. All right? Everything about it, everything that I would want to know about pizzas, everything that's relevant to our problem is in the pizza class. So what did we define as being relevant to our problem? Well, the size of the pizza, whether it has pepperoni or not, how much it costs, how long it takes to bake it. Those are the four, those are the handful of things that we decided are relevant. So all of them are encapsulated, that is contained within the class. Now the class is sort of like the template. It's a description that all pizzas follow. All pizzas have a sign associated with them. All pizzas have the answer to the question. And do you have pepperoni? All right. Is pepperoni a type? Yes or no? All right. All pizzas we can calculate the cost. Of. All pizzas we can calculate the bake time of. So that is a class. Everything that we're in about a pizza is in that class. All right. An object then is when we make a specific member of the class. So getting back to your terminology and definitions, an object is a specific member of the class. In other words, it's not just this random abstraction of a pizza. It's that pizza that's sitting over there on that table. All right? 
And it's going to have specific values for all its attributes. And it will also have all the methods that can be called. Now again, there was a little confusion before about the word attributes and methods and all that. Let's talk about them. Attributes are characteristics. So we've defined two characteristics that are important about the pizza. The size of it and whether it has pepperoni or not. Those are the two characteristics that we're interested in in pizza. Now we could add more things, right? We could have thick crust versus thin crust. We could have additional times and so on. But if we were going to do that, we would put that code in the pizza class would make another characteristic for it, would have type of crust, all right? Would have, has mushrooms, or whatever. So, and then we would maybe all methods to, maybe this, the, the kind of crust, crust uh, is relevant as far as how long we bake it. Maybe we bake a thick crust longer than we bake a thin crust, for example. So that would be another factor that we would consider in there. And certainly, maybe they would have an impact on the product. But the point is, is I would put that in the pizza class itself. I wouldn't put that anywhere else. So for example, if I added a type of crust, I would not go to my test class. I would not go to my test class and say, I'm going to create a variable here let's say it's an extra buck for a thick crust pizza I would not go to my test class and say something like This is what I would not do. Could you do it? I mean, would it work? Like HTML and CSS, for example, if you put the style. Could you do it? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things you could do. But it's wrong. And what is wrong about this? It's wrong because it violates the notion of encapsulation. All right? This is some information about the way that pizzas are priced. All right? If we added the rule to say that pizzas that are thick crust is an extra dollar, that is a rule about pizzas. And that's part of the method, that's part of the calculation for determining the price of a pizza. All right? What is wrong about that is Anything about the rules of pizza, any attributes of pizza, the kind of crust is an attribute of pizza, right? It's a characteristic of a pizza. You know, I could point over there and say that one's a thick crust, that one's a thin crust. It's a characteristic. Any of those attributes or any of the methods that deal with pizza belong only in one place. And that is the pizza class. Okay? What I've done here is I've taken and I have part of the cost calculation happening in the pizza class and part of it happening here. And so that would be like, well, here is your allergy pill. Take this, but oh yeah, you got to take this as well. What's the problem of that? Well, the problem with that is we're not going to have consistency. 
everyone who ever uses a pizza is going to have to remember to put that code in there. And that's not a good idea because someone's going to forget. Or we're going to change it to be an extra $2 for a thick crust pizza or something along those lines. Or maybe a small thick crust is whatever. The no encapsulation is everything about an entity ought to be in one place. So any characteristic of a pizza, any rule about pizza, any calculation dealing with pizza, any method dealing with pizza belongs in one place. We don't want any information about a pizza living anywhere outside of the pizza class. And why is that? Because we want a component that we can plug a pizza object in anywhere that's expecting a pizza object and everything about object then will be available to it. We don't have to add a little bit of extra code to adjust the price if they ordered thick crust or anything like that. So that's the notion of encapsulation. Everything about an entity is in the class for that entity. All right? We don't, and the reason for that is we don't want to split our code. Back in the old days, like I bought punch cards to lab before, right? And in the old days, when we did what was called procedural programming, spaghetti coding, yes, and also we would have the issue of bits and pieces of the business's rules were strewn about through a bunch of different programs. So there might be one report that's run, uh, give you an example from a company that I went, uh, that I worked at. There might be one report that was run that would say what cars in a branch need an oil change, right? You know, if you're a car company, you know, make sure you're changing on your car because your car will be doing oil changes for you. You have to remember, and otherwise, burn out engines, right? So we might have a report that says this branch, these are the, these are the branches, or these are the cars in your branch that need an oil change. We might have a different program that when you bring up a car on the screen, it displays whether it needs an oil change or not. In the old days, that code lived in the two different programs. In other words, report one that we mailed to the branch manager every month was a COBOL program probably that went through and read through the file, looked at the last uh, oil change date, looked at the current date, did a calculation and said, yeah, this car is an oil change. Guess what? That same code was duplicated in the program that displayed a car up on the screen and said, yes, it needs an oil change. No, it doesn't. So we'd have the same code in two places. Well, you know what's wrong with that, right? Number one, every time they change the rule, look, we've been having a lot of trouble with cars burning out, so we better change, instead of getting an oil change every eight months, we better get an oil change every six months or every four months or whatever, all right? Guess what's going to happen? person's going to change it one place and not in the other, and then you're going to have inconsistencies. In the object oriented world, if we had that, we would have an automobile class. And there would be a method that says needs or change. Anywhere in any application, whether it be the screen, the monthly report, anything, the contract when someone goes in to um, rent a car and they bring up the car that they're going to give them, any program that needed to know, hey, this car needs an oil change, is going to be calling the same piece of code. Because it's calling the code that lives in the automobile object. All right? That's what encapsulation is. That code isn't going to live in separate places. Everything about the car is going to be in one place. So we just have to bring that in and we get the right results. Now, there could be a mistake in it, right? I could have done the calculation wrong. Or the business might change its policy and say, gee, we've been spending too much on oil changes. Let's do them every four months instead of every three months or whatever. All right? Well, 
If we have to change it, just one place to change it. If, they have, if, if I have to fix a bug or if the business changes its policy. One place and one place alone that I'm going to go in the code and change it. As opposed to having these little silos of code, none of which talk to each other, that duplicates the same functionality throughout. All right. So that's the notion of encapsulation. You create an encapsulation by designing objects, which are templates for members of an entity. Each individual member of that entity is an object. Another way to say it is as an instance. So if we had a car company, let's say that was our lot over there, all right, there'd be an automobile class that would have all the information that any automobile would have. The serial number, license plate number, um, the, the kind of engine it has, the, the make, the model, color, all those properties or attributes, right? That's the same thing, all right? And then it would have all the methods like, is this due for an oil change? How much is the monthly payment on this? And so on down the line. All right? Now, I go over and I point to a Cadillac Escalade that's blue and has a license plate number of ABC123. That's an object. That's an instance. That's a member of the class. All right? That's a specific car and have specific values for the attributes. So in the class, we define a template. Cars have license plate numbers. Cars have um, makes. Cars have models. Cars have serial numbers. All that stuff. Each instance, then, is going to have its values for that particular thing. Now, again, our pizza example, the attributes are... Again, the things are declared outside of any method. Those are the characteristics of that object. Or, I'm sorry, of that class. These are called instance variable, variables because every member of the class, that is every pizza, is going to have its own value for the size of it and for whether it has pepperoni or not. So instance variables, method, uh, um, properties, attributes, all mean the same thing. Now as far as private versus public, this relates to who can access these different things. Private means only the class itself can access that attribute. Public means that any class can access that attribute or method. As a general rule, we're going to make our attributes private and, our, and most of our methods anyhow are going to be public. The reason for that is we don't want other classes manipulating the values of the attributes without going through our methods. For example, set size. There's a method that sets the size of the pizza. We know because we wrote this that there's only three possible choices, S, M, and L, right? I could put validation in here that made sure, and we're not going to do that today, but I could put validation in here that ensured that when we set the size of the pizza, it's one of those three values, S, M, or L. All right. Now, if I made the attribute public, then people could circumvent my validation and just directly set that variable, that attribute, to extra, extra large. All right. And what happens then? I don't know. The program isn't built to handle that. All right. So if the only values of the size of the pizza are small, medium, and large, well, we shouldn't let, and when I say people, I mean other objects, all right? I mean other code, other programmers. I shouldn't let other code set that size to anything they want to. 
I want to control how that's set, and I can control it by putting that in a method. Because then, and we're not doing it today, but I could put validation in here. That makes sure, G. if you try to set the size of the pizza to extra, extra large, it's going to give you an error. You had a question? Couldn't you use enumerators instead? You could do a lot of things. And I don't mean to be flip, but at this point, the question is, is why make it private versus public? And again, right now, the answer isn't immediately obvious. You just have to trust me to say that the reason that we are doing it that way is we want to control access to those attributes. All right? And we want to control how attributes are being set. If we make the attribute itself public, all right, then that attribute could get manipulated. All right. I'm going to go a little bit longer. I'm, I'm sorry for going long because I do want to address one last thing. And that is the purpose of the test class. What do we put in the test class? Or the unit test? Keep in mind, the reason we have a unit test class is because we don't have a GUI. We don't have a system to hook our classes up to. We don't have a pizza ordering screen where someone can go in and say, I want to order a pepperoni pizza. I want to order a cheese pizza. Tell me the amount of the order. But we still want to test our pizza classes. And how are we going to test them? Well, we're going to hard code some values in. We're just going to make up and create some test pizzas and make sure that we get the results that we expect. So that's exactly what I'm doing here. Not the logic. Not the logic is in the test class. All the test class is doing is creating the objects, our real objects, <coughs> all right, our objects that are part of the property domain, our objects, our business classes. We're setting properties, and then we're calling methods and see what the result is. So effectively, we're testing our classes. Ideally, I like to take and hook this pizza and order class up to a GUI where I could order pizzas to my heart's content and I could go and look and I can verify, yeah, that's the amount of the, that's the amount of the order should be, right? We got it right. But we're not at that point yet. Yet, I don't want to simply go and look and say, yep, that looks right to me. I want to actually test it, all right? And the way that you test it is, we're going to make some test pizzas. All right? We're going to make some test pizzas. I create a new pizza object. I set its properties. Create a second pizza object, set its properties. Add it to the order. And then ask the order what the price is. All right? Now again, in a real environment, we're not going to have a hard-coded thing to create two pizzas and print out the result. In a real environment, our order and pizza class are going to be hooked to a GUI of some nature. right? And the user will select what they want, and the pizzas will get added to the order. And then when they're done, the tally will tell them what the value of the pizza is. But until that point, we want to write some code that's going to test for specific values of our objects. All right? And again, what I could do, I could copy and paste this and do another one if I wanted to. All right? Let's test and make sure that it works if there's three pizzas on the order. All right? Let's make sure it works if they all have pepperoni. Let's make sure it works if none of them have pepperoni. We would think of the different combinations we would want to test and would code a little test case like this. Now, we can put data in the test case by through arrays, through random generation, through hard coding. Doesn't really matter, because this code isn't, we're not going to be using this code. This code exists solely for us to test our other classes. 
Could you put the, the print line in the pizza class? Why is, why is that? Why is the print line at that? Because how do we know we always want to display the amount of the pizza? Alright? How do we know that? We don't. In this case, for example, we don't want to see the result of the pizza. We want to see the total of the order. So we're not interested in seeing that. The short question is, presenting the answer to the user is a function of the user interface. Right? Our classes are not responsible for handling UI sort of things. Their job is to do their job and return the answer and let the UI do with it what it wants to. Let me give you an example. We could be using these order classes in two different places. We could use the order class, all right, in my cash register. As someone calls in and says, give me a, pepperon a large pepperoni, a small cheese pizza, I could be clicking the appropriate things on the GUI, creating my order object, creating my pizza objects, boom, your amount due is $28. Okay? In that case, it's going in and it's taking the, not the total of each individual pizza, but the total of the order, and it's telling me that that's the result. I could be using the same classes to print out on my website, this is how much a small cheese pizza costs. This is how much a small pepperoni pizza costs. This is how much, well, I don't have an order. I'm just showing the prices of the individual pizzas. I could use it in another place. At the end of the day, the boss might see what's the total for all of our orders. They may not need to worry about seeing the individual orders that this one was 28 and this one was 15 and this one was 32 or whatever. They might just want to see that the total of orders for the day was we did $500 in business or whatever. All right. In other words, showing the results is a function of the UI. So as a result, our test class is sort of a replacement or a substitute for the UI. So that's why we're going to put the displays or the printing in the test class. Because we want our classes to do the calculation and return the results. But we don't know where, we don't know what we want to do with those results yet. That's going to depend on the particular use of that class. So the class just returns the answer. Whoever called that class is responsible for deciding what to do with it. All right. I do kind of apologize for going over time today um, and cutting into your lab time. Um, if anyone needs to stay later, uh, they're welcome to. Um, I did not cover constructors, but that's okay. We'll cover those on Monday. If anyone really has questions about constructors, we can talk about them in lab.